Good morning, friends. The scripture reading this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Please stand for the reading of God's word out of reverence for the Lord and his word. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all, because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only when ever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is God's word. It is true, and it is given out of his love. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. As it is on Memorial Day weekend, several of our members are away at the beach or the mountains, and hopefully they're thinking about Jesus. Now, the trade-off is you are here, but you might be tempted to think about the beach and the mountains. (laughs) But stick with me, because I think this is one of the most central texts in 2 Corinthians, and I will say that every week about that text. But for real, (laughs) this is a really important passage. If you're here and someone invited you and you're not a follower of Jesus, we're really glad you're here and you should feel welcome. And I hope and pray that you will witness this room full of people who are adoring Jesus and asking yourself the question, what is it about him that makes them want to follow him and give their lives to him, even to the point of suffering, as we shall see in our passage. And so, Father, would you send your spirit, may he be palpable in this room, This is the new covenant that we live in. And so you delight to pour him out. May may we feel him removing veils, even as your word is taught. Some of us have had the veil, the actual veil removed, but we live as if we still have veils. And some have walked into this room with the veil of unbelief. Would you remove it by your grace? in the power of the Spirit. Give them a new heart. As they hear the word, may they come to realize it is a word for them and it is a word of life and help them to behold your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. What validates you and gives you significance? That is a fundamental question, but there are moments that God brings into our life where we are forced to ask it like not getting that job you really wanted, like getting passed over for some promotion, or perhaps most intensely to lose a job you really liked. And now it becomes a question like, what what makes me worthwhile? Because your gifts are being questioned, your motives are being questioned, your your ability, your background. Uh, Picture Paul, and this is happening to him very intensely. Uh, People are questioning him, and he's in a trial of sorts. So there's this prosecution attorney saying, Paul, like we're trying to work with you here, but 
It's, it's really hard. I mean, look at how many people dislike you. Look at how much opposition you're experiencing. Like, the, the word is out. Like, wh- why should we not fire you as an apostle? And so Paul's response is a little unique. He says, um, could you tell me what time it is? The prosecution attorney takes the little mini sundial on his wrist and moves it up. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about that, okay? I mean, in the grand sweep of history, where are we right now? And so Paul sets in with this understanding of not just who I am and what is my purpose, but a really powerful and equally important question of when am I When am I, at what point in history, do I live? And the answer to that question is the validity and the sufficiency and the confidence of anybody who wants to run hard after Jesus. And some of you might be there this morning. Someone is questioning you. Maybe Satan is assaulting you with questions of what gives you the ability to stand before a holy God. And the answer is in this passage, and it has to do with time. And so... We live in this setting where we're in the shadow of two blue-chip universities. That was not meant as a pun, but take it as if it was. Um, And one of the biggest validations is, of course, where we went to college, the diploma, right? And the more blue-chip it is, the more we try to work it into conversations. Our persona and personality in the West, in America, In particular, when you think about leadership, it's mainly about persona and personality, being gregarious, extroverted, whether you have charisma, emotional presence, that's a big thing now. All those are good things. But what makes you sufficient? Is it your resume, your network, your education, your experience, your theological tribe, your level of personality? Have you published who recommends you? Again, none of those are bad in and of themselves. In fact, now we're in the season where we're in about a month, on June 5th, with all the members assembling here because you know that it is core to your membership responsibilities. And so you will joyfully come on June 5th, not thinking, oh, I'll just let the Jedi members go to that meeting. All of you are Jedi members. And so you must ask the question, what is inherently getting in my way that I cannot choose to avoid And if not, I will come to the membership meeting. You'll get to see Eric Rogers do his thing probably as well, which we we love, uh, turning the uh, Excel spreadsheet into a moment of joy for us. And we have to affirm uh, elders and deacons. And you really have to ask the question, who would I feel good putting my vote behind? Those are really significant roles. And we're looking for a kids minister, when we hire staff, like what is the most important things about that person that would say, hey, come and be an influence here at the Bible church? A reminder that the big argument of this letter is that the cross comes before the crown, that suffering comes before glory in spirit-filled gospel ministry. So Paul is making one of the craziest self-defenses in the world. He's not defending himself. He's actually defending God and his glory. And inasmuch as Paul reflects God and his glory, Paul is sufficient. He is able to do his job as an apostle. And what Paul does in this chapter is to say this is about where we are in history, this is about glory, and this is about the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at three sections, because it always breaks down into three sections. First, the work of the Spirit to build a real resume, verses 1 through 3. And then the ministry of the Spirit to give us real sufficiency, 4 through 6. And finally, 7 through 18, the glory of the Spirit to unveil our hearts. So first of all, the work of the Spirit to build a real resume. Paul begins, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Am I falling back into this fleshly way of defending myself? No is the actual answer. Do we need as some to provide letters of recommendation? For you Now, what is he talking about? If you were on a trip as a formal kind of envoy or representative, and the people that 
you were going to did not know you. You had to bring some kind of validation, a letter of recommendation from an accepted and credible source. And you would give that to those people, and they would say, oh, so-and-so or this denomination or this tribe affirms you, so we will listen to you. And Paul is saying, I will not play that game. Our world lives according to that game. He says, I do have letters of recommendation. You know what it is? It's you. In 1999, Rebecca and I were at the graduation ceremony at Wheaton College, not because we were graduating, but we had a bunch of college students that we had discipled and poured our life into, and a bunch of them were graduating that year, and we were watching them go down the aisle of Edmund Chapel to get their seats on the stage, and it just hit us both, like, that's it. That's the point of ministry. The glory of Jesus, but those lives, that's what makes it worth it. That's what we do, what we do. Those are our letters of recommendation. Paul says those type of letters are written on hearts, not pieces of paper. They're written by Christ. The ink is the Holy Spirit. But God loves to use people. He loves to use you and me. And so he says, I am an instrument, just the instrument. Jesus is the one who's ultimately doing it. But I am that instrument. And a quick word to those of you who are in suffering right now, and it might be for the sake of the gospel, it might be because you're in a fallen body, in a fallen world. And we'll get back to this as we conclude, but I want you to remember chapter 1 where it says that in your afflictions, God is comforting you so that one day you will be able to bring God's comfort to another person. And I want you to remember that you are not sidelined in this moment, but, but this valley that you are going through might be God's very point at which he turns up the dial on your effectiveness for the sake of the gospel. All right, like this might be the moment where he's preparing you to write some serious letters of recommendations as you bring Jesus to another person's life. And so the prosecution attorney is getting after Paul, and, he's, and now Paul takes his stand. He hasn't hired an attorney. He's going to defend himself. And he calls two witnesses, and he, he calls up the first witness to the stand. He says, will you please give me your name and then state your testimony? And the first witness says, my name is Ezekiel 11. 19 through 20. And here is my testimony. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. Paul says, thank you. Second witness, will you come to the stand? What is your name? My name is Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. And what is your testimony? And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You, will, you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And he says, thank you. When God wants to get a point across, he repeats himself. So this is going to shape everything Paul says here, because what we're talking about is this new covenant. There are two phases of history. Two primary phases. Some of you grew up in churches where there was color-coded charts and there were five distinct phases or seven distinct phases. Well, the Bible really just says there's two. There's the point at which you go from creation all the way to Jesus. And this was marked by an a intense need for a redeemer to fix the problems of the world. And in order to appreciate the Redeemer, you had to be changed from the inside out, and only God's Spirit could do that to give you a joyful desire to obey God out of love and trust in Him. That's the old covenant. Now, the new covenant is where that Messiah, that Redeemer, has come, and He has done a mighty work on the cross. But the Spirit of God also has to be poured out so that work can be applied to our hearts and change us from the inside out. And now we await His return. And in the meantime, the Spirit is giving us the desires and the ability to obey the Word of God out of love and trust in Him. Old covenant, new covenant, set your clock to that. So Paul, again, is saying, where are we? And he says, we are in the new covenant, and that has everything to do with my validity to be an apostle. Okay, so now we go from the work of the Spirit to build a real resume, 
to the ministry of the Spirit in the new covenant to give us real sufficiency. Verse 4, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Notice that he says God is the real judge. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So he's like, you're right. I am not sufficient. I am weak. I am hounded on every side. Sometimes I make mistakes, but it's never been about me. It has been about God, the God who has made me sufficient, given where we are in time. And he then goes to the letter versus the spirit. So it's like he's saying, so I talk about the letters of recommendation. Speaking of the letters of recommendation, let's look at history. Let's look at the word of God. Now, this comparison between the letter and the spirit is very crucial. And there has been misteaching over the years. And I want you to see the relationship as the scripture presents it, which will hopefully totally unmask and liberate big sections of the Bible for you. So when he talks about the letter, he is referring to the law of Moses. The Ten Commandments is central to that, but all the stuff in Leviticus and Exodus, all of that is the letter. And when he says that the letter kills, he is not saying, this is crucial, he is not saying that the law of God is inherently legalistic. And phew, we've come to the age of Jesus, and Jesus just drop kicks the law of God away, and he replaces it with relationship and love. That is not what he is saying. What he is saying, and you can see it in the flow of his argument here, is that in the Old Covenant, the big difference is that the Spirit of God had not been poured out. And so without the ability to have new desires and new strength from within us, we are uh, we're not capable of following the law of God because we have rejected God, and of course we're going to reject his word. And so because of that, the law then condemns us because we're never going to keep it. We don't want to keep it. But the new covenant is marked by this age where the law still stands. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And one of the ways he fulfills it is sending the spirit to change us from the inside out such that we love God, trust God, and now want to follow his word. And you will see this in Romans chapter 7. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, we are no longer under condemnation because we're in Christ Jesus. The spirit of God is given to us so that we can now walk in the scriptures. We can now fulfill the word of God. So apart from the scripture, the letter, the law of God kills us because we are unholy and incapable of following it. In the new covenant, the spirit of God changing us from the inside out enables us to keep the word of God. So it is not law of God against love of God. It is word of God without spirit, word of God with spirit. That is the comparison that's really, really important. Uh, In fact, the law of God assumes we are sinful and gives us provisions for atonement, calling us to repent and to receive grace. So anytime you're thinking the law is inherently legalistic, the whole atonement need of grace thing is written into the law with the sacrificial system. Okay, so dog ear that. Your validation, your sufficiency, your confidence as a servant of the Lord is all based in God, the work of the Spirit, who changes people from the inside out. So in as much as you can say that your life is committed to showing people Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit through Scripture, then chin up, baby. Chin up. That is your confidence. That is your sufficiency regardless of your personality, regardless of your resume, if you can say my main aim in life is in the power of the Spirit to show people Jesus through the Word of God, and it doesn't matter where you get your paycheck. We're not talking about professionals. You get your paycheck from a company where you're coding, uh, where you are a police officer, where you are a nanny, where you are an athlete, where you are an artist, whatever it is, Whoever gives your paycheck, your main goal through the use of your gifts and opportunities there 
If that is to show people Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, chin up because you are making the real resume of life, okay? You are having your letters of recommendation. So now we've gone from the work of the Spirit and the ministry of the Spirit to thirdly, the glory of the Spirit, 17 through 18. And there are two subsections here. One, Paul is going to interpret Scripture. And then second, Paul is going to apply Scripture. He's a good preacher. And he calls a third witness to the stand. And that witness goes up and he says, will you give us your name? And he says, Exodus 32 through 34. He says, don't share your testimony because Jay doesn't have enough time to read all of it. But he says, just summarize it for me, can you? He says, all right, so uh, here's my testimony. There's a guy named Moses, and there's this mountain called Sinai, and there's these tablets of stone, and the, the word of God is written on these tablets of stone. And Moses goes up to the top, and he's in the glorious presence of God. And he comes down only to see the people that had gotten impatient. And they didn't just, like, change their mind. They really just became who they were, and they created a golden calf, and they worshipped it. And one of the things they did was to, to walk in sexual deviancy, and that's the whole attraction of idolatry. So Moses is really disappointed and angry, and he throws the tablets down, and they break. And then he realizes God's about to destroy all of his people. So he says, God, please don't do that. Take my life instead as a representative. And God's like, I can't do that because you're not a big enough Messiah. And, and so then there's a little bit of judgment, but God has grace. And then there's new tablets of stone. Moses says, can I see your glory? And he says, well, you can see my backside. And then there's this veil thing, because now we know that the people are sinful, even though they had gotten physically saved out of Egypt. They're unholy people. And so Moses has a veil over his face to protect the people ultimately, which now we're going to come to understand this veil thing in just a second. But the sad part of that is the people of God cannot be in the glorious presence of God. Because if they do, they will be destroyed. Not because the glory wants to destroy, but because they are unholy and they reject the glory. Okay? So let's, let's sum all of that up. We've got Moses, Sinai, stone tablets, God's holy presence, sinful and unholy people, a veil, judgment, and death, Moses and his intercession, God saying no. So we need a redeemer. Who's, gonna, who's going to save all of this? The question you need to be asking at this point is, okay, wait, hold on. He's writing this letter to Corinthians. The Corinthians are mostly Gentiles. So why is he using this example of the history of the Jewish people to make an argument for Gentiles? So what Moses is doing is saying, look, you're witnessing me, and, and you're primarily watching my own people try and destroy me. And I want to explain this to you because you're saying it's about me, and it's a problem with me. And I am saying there's something going on in the hearts of those Jewish people. And that's why they're trying to destroy me. So these Gentiles are, are watching this and they're weaponizing Paul's suffering at the hands of his own people. But the other thing Paul is doing, and this is for all of us, is saying the history of Israel is also the heart condition of every human being. There, there is something going on in those people's lives such that when they see the gospel and the servants of the gospel, they want to take it out. And that is the problem of the opponents in the church of Corinth as well. They are being like the Israelites of old at Sinai. Okay? So now we have these contrasts. Moses is being contrasted with new covenant ministers. The law without the spirit is being contrasted with the law with the spirit. We have protection from glory versus being exposed to glory. And we have the impermanent versus the permanent. And so this veil thing. Go to verse 7 with me. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Again, this could be misunderstood easily. Um, the point there is not that Moses was so beaming with this electric light energy from the presence of God that it was just too bright. No one had Ray-Bans back then, so we've got to protect them. Okay, that's not what he's saying. Nor is he saying that he goes up to the top of the mountain and he gets this fresh dose of glory. And at first it's like, and everybody's like, oh, and so he puts the veil over his face, but it's like a battery. It begins to fade, right? Like every one of you that's invested in a Tesla, you don't know it's going to fade eventually. All right. Um, and it's kind of embarrassing because then the people were like, well, what's, I thought our God is infinite and why is the glory fading? And 
That could be one interpretation of this passage. But I don't think that's what Paul is saying. The word, therefore, being brought to an end is a word that means its efficacy is being nullified. What's going on is that you have these unholy people, and if they gaze at the glory of God straight on, without any kind of covering or mediation, they will be destroyed because they're unholy and sinful. And so the veil is a double act of mercy, keeping that from happening, bringing the power of the glory to an end, in other words, causing it not to destroy the people, but it's also a testimony of sadness. Like God had done all of this work to save them, and now they're separated from God. This veil is a testimony of their inability to see God because of their sin. But here's the good news. It's in verse 8. In this new covenant that we live in now, there is a new pathway for glory. Look at verse 8. Will not the ministry of the Spirit of this new covenant age have even more glory? Not like five glories in the Old Testament, ten glories now, but more eternal, life-giving glory. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must, must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what's once, what's, what once had glory had come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpassed it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. The old covenant, only condemnation a lesser glory in that sense. But now with the Spirit of God changing people from the inside out, it's an even greater, forever life-giving glory. Oh, I love that. And then we're at Trinity Sunday, right? Uh, last week was Pentecost. In some sense, this should have been preached last Sunday with Pentecost, with all of this business about the Spirit. But I'm going to get the Trinity in this Sunday, okay? No extra cost. What Paul is saying is that the Spirit of God is really vital in our justification. Like, often we think, okay, Jesus is justifier. He is the Savior. And then, like, a baton pass, Jesus gives the baton to the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit takes it from there, right? Well, the whole Trinity is conspiring in your initial moment of salvation. In this imagery that we're going to see in a section, the Holy Spirit is going to make it such that you are able to see Jesus and have faith in him. And so he's right there, right involved in your initial justification, you being made right with God. And that gets us then to the application. We've had the interpretation. We're in the new covenant. Spirit's at work. Changed from the inside out. Greater glory now. So those of you in the Corinthian church who are able to listen to me, I want you to rejoice that I am your pastor And that you get to be a part of this too. So why are the opponents rejecting me within your body? It's because they are like the Israelites of old who have a veil over their hearts. Such that they cannot actually see the glory of God. And they reject the glory of God. So verse 12, we have such hope. We are very bold. I'm not going to back away. I'm going to be bold. Not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Now picture someone like me up here, and I know that I've got to be faithful and show you the glory of God by giving you this book. But what if I knew that all of you were hard-hearted, and not only were you not able to understand this, but you just would never want to. And so in giving you the word of God, all that word was going to do was going to condemn you. Now here's the thing, I have good theology, so I know you deserve it, But I also love you. And I'm not going to be bold. In fact, I I would be tempted to like go behind a screen. And some of you grew grew up in traditions like this where the, the, the pastor would actually go behind a screen and he would like preach and do communion by himself because you actually couldn't be in the presence of God. It had to be mediated for you. Now, Change the scene, and now I'm up here, and I'm showing you the glory of God by giving you this word, but I know that almost everybody in the room has been changed from the inside out, and you're hungry for God, and you love God, 
and you want to follow God and you want to keep his word because you believe his word is life. And so I'm going to be bold. I'm going to lean in. I am going to sometimes shout. I'm going to give you this glory because as you look at this glory and you see the living glory, Jesus, you are going to come to life. That's what's going on in verse 12. So Moses is bold. He, he, or uh, uh, Paul is bold. He's going to lean back in because he knows the Spirit of God is working in the majority of the Corinthians' life. And so, in explaining why he's being rejected by his fellow Jews and a small group of opponents in the Corinthian church, he says in verse 15, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. So he brings a fourth witness to the stand, and the witness is named Deuteronomy 29, verse 2, and I think Paul is riffing off of this, and he says, and it says, and Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. So there's Israel. They've been delivered from the superpower of the day, Egypt and Pharaoh. God has done miracles that no one can explain. They saw it all with their own eyes. And now they're grumbling and rejecting. Why? Why is it there are people in this room who have experienced the tremendous, miraculous power of God and it has done nothing? I think I've shared this story before, but I had a... I have a friend, and, and he's from a very large family of strong believers, except one brother does not believe. He's an atheist. And that brother said, you know, I just, I don't have convincing proof that God exists. He's like, I would need God to cut my legs off, and then maybe I would believe. And the question is, if nothing changes in his heart, God cutting his legs off would not bring him to trust God. Like when you are sharing the gospel with someone and it's just like nothing, it's, it's, because, it's not that you lack persuasiveness. I imagine some of you are very persuasive. You can give all the least trouble arguments. And I'm saying these are good things, by the way. Apologetics is good. Logic is good. But unless something happens miraculously in that heart, nothing will change. You can go to church your whole life, have the right doctrinal confessions, all of that, but your heart must change. God has to do something. So what does God do? This is one of the most beautiful descriptions of what conversion looks like. Verse 16, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. I grew up with some, what seemed to be amazingly strong Christians in my youth group. Many of them much brighter wise than me. I am one of just three people that I know of that have continued to walk with the Lord. Why? Because there's a little spark in me, a little bit more wisdom in me, because God removed, removed a veil. Out of his sovereign love, he removed a veil, and every day he keeps the, the veil at bay. And so I was able to see Christ. That's what it means to become a Christian, ultimately, is that you see Christ. You do not see an institution. You do not see a room of people. You do not see, see a, a tradition, per se. You see Christ. You see Christ. And God, by pure grace, and a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit is doing that with lots and lots of people. And when this happens, it is what Paul calls freedom. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord there is freedom. Isn't that what you want? Freedom from that binding blindness the sinfulness, the self-destructive behaviors, the other destroying behaviors, the misunderstanding, the, the reality that we see all the facts, but we're never able to put it together. We are freed from all of that, and we are freed to Jesus. 
We are freed to see him. We are freed to look right into the glory of God and not be destroyed, but rather to be given life, more life every day, enjoying the glory of God from it becoming our destruction to being able to see it more in its beauty every day. And friend, in heaven forever and ever and ever, you will see more of the glory and appreciate more of the glory and take in more of the glory forever and ever and ever, giving your soul satisfaction upon satisfaction upon satisfaction. I love that. And he says, the Lord is doing it, who is the Spirit. He is not uh, confusing Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but he is saying, the Lord who is working at Mount Sinai is working by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you must have the veil changed. Father, I'm going to pray even now that there are people in this room right now who are having the veil removed so that they can finally see Jesus and be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. And so let's talk about implications just for a second. One of the implications is for our mission as a church. All of us are ministers of the gospel at the Bible Church. And we have this mission statement that I'll say now, but I know you've all memorized it, okay? But just in case, and you can go ahead and say it with me if you want. Our mission is to equip our church as a community to reach the triangle and beyond with the message of Jesus. I know you've all memorized it. When we're done in the fall talking about these things, we're all going to have a tattoo put on our back shoulder, and we'll just line up and have it tattooed. So equip, community, reach are the vital parts of that sentence. And equip, I mean, this is our, our fundamental thing as a church, is, is to equip you using the word of God. And we have core values. We'll probably get you this at some point. It'll be part of the tattoo. There's a core value behind each of these things. And the core value for equipping is this statement. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to build the people of God for the glory of God. My call to you, regardless again of where you get your paycheck, is that you would make that your value. Whether it's writing code sewing up wounds, being an athlete, physical therapist, stay-at-home parent, whatever it is, if you're an arms dealer, you need to repent, uh, you would commit yourself to being a part of the story where the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to build the people of God for the glory of God. Be bold with that. Be bold with that. So back to elders and deacons that we're going to affirm. Um, It's hard to trust people. Uh, Our American story is based on the suspicion of concentrated power. And you better believe that's worked its way into the church. And now culturally, in the last five years, authority and power are more, there's more suspicion and rejection of that than ever before. And so we have options and One option is to try and negate it as much as possible and to clip the wings of anybody that has that. But there is one fundamental problem to that, and it's this book. So we have to redeem it, not destroy it. Um, God has set up the church to be led by elders and, and deacons. And so we need to go back to the question of, okay, what validates a biblical elder and deacon. What is it about those men and women that I would want to follow them and trust them and allow them and bless them and encourage them to use influence at this church? Some professional background is fine, especially when it comes to things like finances and whatnot. Charisma is fine. You, uh, good-looking elders and deacons, that's, that's great too, um, but that's not the bottom line. You are looking for men and women who have a track record of having letters of recommendation written by the Spirit of God. Okay? So the structure, that's all important. But are these men and women who have brought Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit using the Word of God into people's lives? That's what you're looking for. Gospel resumes. This also defines the pastor's task. There's a lot of administration that must be done and 
all of that is fine. But the most important part of a pastor's task, where he gives most of his energy and his time and his concentration, is to bring the power of the Spirit through the Word of God such that Jesus is seen and glorified, and we do this with confidence. And I would ask that you would encourage us to do that. You would enable us to do that, and you would pray for us to do that. But then this is for all of you members at this church. And we're, our prayer as a leadership is that membership wouldn't just be, okay, this is the church I'm going to attend every week, but this is my body. This is my team, and we're going to serve Jesus together. We just had a staff advance on Monday and Tuesday. What in the world is a staff advance? Well, it's not a retreat. A retreat is where you go to rest and rejuvenate. And advance is where you talk about vision. Did you get that? Like, okay, so planning and stuff. Um, and so we're talking about vision and pathways and goals and metrics and all of that stuff, and it's good. But one of the things that we were reminded of is all about people. It's all about people. Our budget. Our goals. This building. Our staff. It's all about people. Bringing Jesus and the power of the Spirit, using the Word of God into people's lives so they can behold the glory of God. In the fall, in November, we're going to do a two-part series on spiritual gifts again. Because we think it is vital for you to understand how God has gifted you individually to be a part of this story. So some of you are very aware of your gifts, but we're going to have an inventory that we're going to call all of you to take. It's being put together right now. And we will all take that, and you will be reinforced or come to realize your spiritual gifts for the first time, because that's God's armament that he has given you in this battle to see the glory of God give life to our world. So I'm excited about that. Now, as I say that, here is my pastoral encouragement by way of telling you I understand. Um, if you really are going to use your spiritual gifts in this ministry of the new covenant, here's my promise to you. You will suffer. You're going to get it. There's risk. And it's... I have certain types of risk, but I also realize I'm in Christian settings most of the time. You occupy shoes I will never occupy out there. And if you haven't noticed, this triangle that we live in is very interesting because it's very segmented. There, there's a line at which you cross around where the airport is on 40 where life changes. Raleigh, Cary, Apex are a different world. Okay? You come to Durham, Chapel Hill, Carborough, different. Now, Raleigh has its issues. There's a legalism, religiosity, externalism. Those are things that the Word of God has to confront there, but we've got radical secularism and anti-Christianity out here. It is hard soil, but God has called us as Team Bible Church to be here of all places. Okay? And so you going out with your reputation and your good name and being a radical, obvious follower of Jesus is going to bring risks, but it's worth it. I promise you it is worth it because those letters of recommendation, that's good stuff. On your final day in this world, you will never give a thought to your fidelity account. What will make you gratified and ready to see Jesus face to face is knowing that you had a bunch of letters of recommendation. Some of you can name five right now. If you haven't had the opportunity to invest your life in this, then now is the time. So I want you to pray that God will give you a heart to do it. Pray that he opens doors. He will and you would begin to act. It doesn't have to be a formal discipleship relationship, but maybe it would be. But you begin to invest in people's lives, in the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing Jesus to them, using the Word of God. And because it's the work of the Spirit, it's not on your shoulders. It's not on your shoulders. You be faithful. The Spirit will do the work. Same thing with sharing the gospel. Like, 
have good gospel explanations and the power of your own testimony, but you're basically there praying that God would open the heart right in front of you. And in many cases, he will. But either way, you can walk away confident and bold. For those now, finally, who are in a moment of suffering, I said this already, but I want to say it again. Perhaps it's health, loss of a relationship, loss of a job, loss of financial strength. And you think you've been sidelined and you have lost your ability to be used of God. Please don't listen to that lie of Satan. You are in the moment of strength. You are in the moment of strength. This is the moment where God is filling your inkwell and he is going to write. And oh, is he going to write some beautiful letters of recommendation. I love this gospel because because of the new covenant, our weakness is now strength. So, be weak, but trust God to be strong. Kind of changes the perspective on suffering, doesn't it? So, Father, do this work in us by the miraculous work of the Spirit. There are Christians in this room who are living as if there is a veil, and they're still fearing. They're still hiding from your glory, and they're still forgetting all the things that you've done in their life. Be with those who are tempted to feel like they've been sidelined and that they don't deserve your glory because they are going through suffering right now, many for the sake of serving your name. Remind them this morning that all of your glory is for them. The veil is gone. Jesus has come. The Spirit is at work in their heart. For those who are struggling with fallen bodies and a fallen world, strengthen them with the strength of the gospel. Even though their outer man might be wasting away, their inner man is being renewed day by day. And again, I pray for anybody that has walked into this room with a veil over their heart. And now, in the midst of your word, they realize it's being removed. And Jesus is no longer an offense, but he is their sweet Savior. May they leave this room as glory seekers and glory livers. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.